Dear colleagues, a very warm welcome. My name is Francisco and I'm managing what we call the platform for shaping the future of advanced manufacturing and production at the World Economic Forum, which is one of the big 18 areas of work that we are running here at the Forum throughout the year. It is a real pleasure to be joined by all of you today for this session on the future of global value chains, in which we will be specifically looking at how companies can both become more resilient while driving sustainability. Now, if we take a step back, and I, and I, can, I can share some context to, to set the stage, I think that we are all pretty much aware that COVID-19 has created a sort of a perfect storm that for the very first time brought in disruptions both on the supply and a demand side. That's been unprecedented and has forced every company, but also governments, to rethink their strategies to manufacturing and supply systems. Now, what we know is that most manufacturing companies who are with technology providers and other supporters are trying to rethink and redesign their strategies. But the current context represents not only a challenge, but also new opportunities. And so specifically, what we want to address, address today and what the two goals for today's are, is first of all, to explore, understand, and try to anticipate all together, what are the new capabilities that companies in collaborations with governments, universities, and civil society can develop and put in place to successfully transform their manufacturing facilities and supply systems in order to be more resilient and be prepared for future shocks. Now, we know that the next shock is likely not going to be related to COVID, but to climate change. So the second goal of the day is really to understand how, as companies redesign the strategies from a value chain perspective, they cannot just look and aim for efficiencies, productivity increases, resilience, but also become more sustainable, transform business models and operating models to enable recycling, reuse, remanufacturing, for example, through new traceability solutions, and also meet the CO2 requirements that most manufacturers are committing to, ideally to become carbon neutral or carbon negative by 2030, because we know that, and we heard that earlier today in many of the sessions, 2050 is way too late for that. Now with that, let me, let me walk you a little bit through the floor and how we'll be operating today. Uh, first of all, we'll start with an opening fire starting conversations with two great voices from our advanced manufacturing and production community and who represent what I believe are two extremely innovative companies who are working with big industrial players on the transformation of manufacturing and supply systems that really represent what, in my view, is a new approach to look at the future of manufacturing. After that, and we'll try to keep that short so that we maximize the time that each of you has to contribute. After that, we'll, most, we'll move straight ahead into the breaker groups. We have over 80 participants connected with, that, with us. So we want to make this highly interactive and we believe that the breaker groups are the way to make that happen. And then, after we have a chance to discuss and focus on specific questions in breakouts, we will bring the entire community back to report and share what the main findings, conclusions, and ideas for our way forward uh, are. Now, with that, let me maybe move on to some final housekeeping items. I don't know if, Maria or Ian, if you can cue the slide that we prepare. This is extremely basic, but Again, this is a private meeting. We want it to be highly interactive. So please stay on mute and unmute yourself whenever you want to intervene and jump in, especially during the breakouts. Turn on your camera. We are far away. I think that the current pandemic is not helping us to be closer as we wish. But if you turn on the camera, I think that it creates a better sense of, of community and it makes it a, a better experience for all of us. And then finally, we strongly recommend to click on the speaker view, point six on the top right of this slide, because that should allow you to have the better experience 
from a, from a, from a let's say, screen uh, and view perspective. Now, with that, just one final important reminder. If we move to the next uh, slide, Maria, please. Once again, we will be running three breakouts after the, the initial uh, introductions. You will see that the first one is on key capabilities to build resilience and more sustainable supply systems. You see those three points in the right. The second breakout will focus on digital traceability tools and solutions that are enabling a circularity across manufacturing supply systems. And then finally, group, group three will focus on critical actions that companies can take to reduce their manufacturing carbon footprint. So how will this work? And I need you to pay attention because it's one of the first times we are trained this is that I need you to be able to choose the breakout you want to be part of. I need you to do the following. First, click on the participants button that we have at the very um, bottom of the page. Once you go there, click on your name, go to more, and then rename your name, which is what we can read and see on screen. Now, as you rename it, put first one, two, or three, and that will give us an indication of the group, the breakout group you, would, you want to show, and then put after the hyphen your name so that we know it is you. So uh, I'll give you maybe 20 seconds to make sure everyone does that. Again, I repeat as we try to update our screen, go to the participants, um, function, click on your name, rename, and choose and write down the number one, two, or three, depending on the group you want to join. Now, while we wait for everyone to work on that and make that happen, uh, let me remind you that if you have any technical issues, you can reach out to any of my colleagues who are supporting these sessions, you will find them under the participants list. And final important point, this is a private session. What that means is that we are running it under Chatham House rule. And therefore, we will not attribute any comments to any individuals. We want this to be an open and frank discussion. So we will certainly provide a summary of what we'll be discussing, but comments will not be attributed to individual. And we kindly ask you all to do the same and behave in the same way. With that, let me hand it over to the person who has kindly accepted to facilitate the overall conversation. And I'm delighted to introduce Eric Johnson, who is a senior editor at the Journal of Commerce based out of the US and spent his entire career researching and reporting on technology innovation related topics. Eric, over to you and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Francisco, and uh, thank you to the forum for uh, inviting me today. Um, I'm really delighted <clears throat> to, uh, to sort of lead our discussion and, and what should be a, a lot of ground to cover, uh, but all critical kind of discussions that um, everybody here needs to be having. Um, uh, just to reiterate, those three uh, breakout sessions and kind of the three kind of tracks that we're gonna be discussing both in our initial discussion today and also in those breakouts. And then we're gonna reconvene after the breakouts to discuss what each sort of individual session uh, talked about were resiliency and supply chains, traceability uh, for circularity in manufacturing, and then reducing manufacturing's carbon footprint. So think about which, which track uh, most interests you and, and definitely sign up as, as Francisco said for the appropriate breakout session. So a little bit of context for me, um, I, I as, as Francisco said, I am a, a reporter for the Journal of Commerce. We're a, a B2B publication that covers global logistics and trade. Um, we reside within a larger organization called IHS Market. Um, I'm in the Maritime and Trade Division within IHS Market. Um, and, and what I cover is a, a sliver uh, or a component of broader supply chains, end-to-end -end supply chains. We really look at, at the sort of post-production phase to when goods are delivered to distribution centers and, and stores and, and increasingly to final customers. So I look at things from that view, but obviously there's a, a much broader and wider scope that um, companies that are involved in global supply chains or value chains, as we refer to them, 
in this session uh, that they have to consider. And so we'll talk about a lot of those components, especially the, the production phase, the, the manufacturing phase. Sustainability uh, is now an imperative. And it's not 10 years ago when we could kind of check the green box that we had done, what, done our due diligence and figured out what, what our carbon footprint was and moved on to kind of status quo um, and move on to other priorities. It's really changed. Um, and and uh, as an example of how that's changed, I'll give a little bit of background on something I did in an initiative I did about a decade ago, where we, uh, my team and I were looking at uh, logistics procurement and we were asking specifically about how companies were procuring space on ocean vessels and in trucks and whether sustainability or carbon footprint was an actual factor in the decision making process above price and service, kind of the, the two traditional metrics. And I think less than 3% of, of uh, respondents back then a decade ago said that it, was, it made a difference in terms of who their service provider is. I think if we were to do that same survey again today, we'd see drastically different results. Um, clearly the, the imperative in front of us is, is plain to see. And I think COVID is, has been an accelerant for investment in digital. Um, and, and the positive news, I think, is that these trade-offs are not necessarily, th these are not necessarily trade-offs or zero-sum games, right? We can rethink things from an efficiency standpoint by investing in digital capability that can have an impact on sustainability and, and vice versa. Um, and, and I'm seeing this in the space that I cover specifically, uh, it, you know, where there's movement, not just in terms of sentiment, but in terms of actual product development. Um, and that's really interesting. You know, we're, I'm seeing software companies that are helping uh, their customers strategize around green initiatives. Uh, global logistics providers are, are uh, showing their customers their sort of carbon footprint heat maps to help them adjust uh, appropriately. There's just more sophistication. Um, and we're going to be talking more holistically about this than, than just the area I cover, as I mentioned. Um, if it feels like time is running short, um, that's probably because it is, and, and, but maybe that's the catalyst that's needed right now. Um, so today, uh, you know, we should think about the discussion and the output of today as exploring the problems, but also working towards solutions in, lines, in line with the goals of the forum. You know, building the foundations for frameworks that take industries and not just individual companies forward on some of these subjects. So with that all as, as sort of uh, pretext, uh, I, I'm really delighted to introduce our two panelists to kind of kick off our conversation and get our juices flowing for those breakout sessions where we can really dive into specific subjects uh, today. Um, first, I wanted to introduce uh, Gita Schatz, who's president in retail and industry for UL. Gita, thanks so much for joining us. And also Josh Hoffman, uh, who's CEO of Zymergen, uh, an innovative company based out of the Bay Area, correct, Josh? Yep. So uh, really delighted to have both of you here today. So I think in, as, as sort of a, uh, this, is, this is what we're dubbing a fire starter conversation. So this is really to get the, like, the be the kindling for our, our broader conversations later. How, and Josh, maybe I'll start with you. How do you think about something like the discussion that we're going to have today when it seems extremely big and hard for you get to for anyone to get their arms around it in, in in its totality right global supply chains global value chains are are big things on an individual company basis to really understand how do we think about an industry or a set of industries changing yeah so i guess i, I guess the way i start to think about this is to kind of when you're confronted with this giant problem that seems too large uh, to imagine, how do you kind of chunk it up into, into smaller bits that you can actually eat? And so if I think about the value chain problem here, I'm really talking about, I don't know, maybe four separate categories. So what gets produced? How is it actually produced? Where is it produced? And then how do we get it from point A to point B? And, and I think if you, I guess, and of course, this is the world I live in, as you start to break it down into each of those basic categories, I think you can have some cause for optimism, cause for pessimism too, but you can start to imagine how with a combination of technology, uh, incentives, frankly, just focus against each of those things, you can start to make better decisions. So what gets produced, right? You start to see, for example, uh, people are really focusing, EU regulation has been very aggressive in outlawing the kind of microplastics that go into personal care products, right? 
And that has an impact in supply chain. So then you start to say, how is it produced, right? Do we need to, um, you know, do we need to manufacture things in large fixed cost uh, factories where there's, for example, cheap labor, but where cost of energy is high or where transportation costs are high or where, as we've learned in COVID, uh, we're not very resilient to shocks, transport shocks. Um, and that gets to where is it produced? And then how does it go, right? Do we, do we think about shipping versus planes versus whatever? And so as I kind of look at this, I think my push on all these is I, I do think that we have a tendency to imagine doing the same thing in mildly better ways. My, my generalized push would be like Francisco have heard me say this for a while in other contexts. How do we actually foundationally use you know, technology in the, in the broadest sense to change what gets produced and really how it's produced? Can we change not just the way we're shipping goods from point A to point B, right? Uh, which is good, right? I don't mean to diminish that, but we're not going to solve our problems unless we can find foundation new manufacturing methods and foundation new products to manufacture. And so that for me is the place which is maybe the hardest to imagine, but I think where there's the most cause for optimism and the most, uh, the most headroom for change. Yeah, really interesting, Josh. And, and, you know, I see this on a, on a, from a software adoption perspective, you hear people talk about there's, there's incremental value in adopting technology that sort of replaces an existing process. There's huge value gains from rewriting the process in the first place. So, the, but those are intangible things. And you're talking about, you know, tangible production, which is really in interesting. Yeah, can, can I just, can, cause I'm going to have been a bit abstract as I listen to myself. Can I give you a, just an example that might make Absolutely, it yeah. more tangible? So, uh, you know, we're in the chemicals and material space. We engineer microbes to make novel materials things you can't make from petrochemicals. And we do this with a bunch of machine learning and automation, put that aside for a second. But if you think about the, the chemical material space today, it's a $3 trillion sector, it's enormous, right? But at its foundation, these very large fixed cost assets, crackers that sit near a wellhead, generally speaking, right? Or near a gas terminal. And the problem with that is, I mean, that's a billion dollars, it's $2 billion, it's $3 billion of fixed cost asset. But why do you have to do that, right? Why can't you, Right. What we've done is build a technology that allows us to put that manufacturing in something that's much smaller, right? Variableized, right? It's much, much smaller minimum efficient scale that you can put kind of anywhere you've got access to a truckload of sugar. And so what you're doing is you're really shifting in a foundation way the whole structure of the, the production function. And that's pretty exciting because what that does is that that takes what we previously thought were constraints. Wow, I've got to have a billion dollars, I've got to put it near a wellhead, I've got to take safety and environmental risk, right? I've got to manage those risks. Entire. And now you can kind of put it anywhere, right? You can put it in the outskirts of a city and not worry that a hurricane is going to cause it to blow up and kill people. And the point is just to say that we should be looking for opportunities to move the frontier of what we think is possible. That's hard. Yeah, but great. Uh, this is a this is a great you know sort of starting point for some of those conversations. So to your point, if we don't do the hard stuff now, we're we have much bigger problems. That's what we share. Uh, Gita, I wanted to bring you in um, and, and sort of what are you, what are your sort of uh, broader thoughts as and and maybe we can drill down further um, on sort of how you see production systems and global value chains being disrupted. You know, from a from a you know commercial perspective, but also sustainability perspective. Yeah, and, and of course the, the pandemic uh, along with the ongoing trade tensions certainly have uh, exposed uh, more vulnerabilities as well, um, forcing organizations to adapt and, and rethink their, their global value chain. Um, and I think it's also building in that greater resilience as we're talking about. I mean, Questions like, where are you currently manufacturing? Uh, who are your tier one, two, or three suppliers? How resilient are those suppliers? Can you get your raw materials? Can I get to my end consumers? Um, are the suppliers likely to be impacted by climate? Um, are they facing limitations uh, due to new trade restrictions? Um, are they adjusting to meet new safety and sustainability requirements? So there are tons of questions that are out there. And in many cases, Organizations have had to adjust their supply chain, working with new suppliers, adjusting or even setting up new manufacturing facilities. And I think in making these adjustments, if you think of it kind of a half full, half empty, um, there, are, there is actually an opportunity here to build out new capabilities and leverage new technologies that can reduce uh, the carbon footprint. 
and offer greater visibility into your processes and into your supply chain uh, that ultimately can support your overall uh, resilience. If you think of it, if organizations make shifts um, and even if they're thinking about, um, I may need to have a new supplier that may have to have a new manufacturing facility built uh, in a new given country. Well, maybe uh, they will think about new ways how they can think about reducing uh, carbon footprint in the manufacturing. Maybe it's around electrification. Maybe it's about increasing um, our resilience on renewable energy while also leveraging energy recovery systems or investing in additive manufacturing, uh, just to mention a few. I mean, these better and newer facilities and newer technologies to drive improvements in carbon footprint could actually be a good thing when you think about shift in supply, supply chain. Um, and it's also certainly an opportunity to consider those more uh, cons uh, sustainable alternatives as well um, to our raw materials, to our components and how we approach assembly or even the manufacture of the final product. The key thing here, I would say, is how high is sustainability on everybody's agenda, given the global pandemic, given um, everything that's going on, and how do we make it high on the agenda again? And I think definitely the, um, there are various players uh, that should be part of this, right? Um, we, we certainly have to think about how the private-public uh, partnership have to uh, think about this, but we would certainly also have to think about how potentially uh, small medium enterprises with their uh, larger uh, demand drivers, the big companies, how they actually can help each other uh, and certainly um, not just push sustainability on the supplier, but actually help them in that journey uh, because a lot of things are happening right now. And some are just trying to keep their lights on. Uh, so where, where is it on the agenda uh, for these uh, small medium enterprises in the supply chain? How are, are you seeing a shift in mindset in terms of, uh, especially as companies are, uh, you know, some are experiencing huge growth during this year. Some are, you know, struggling, as you said, to keep the lights on. Um, where does, co where does uh, so sort of carbon footprint and broader sustainability initiatives factor in relative to some of those more like ex existential kind of company questions that companies are, are thinking about right now? How is that manifesting itself too, I guess, is probably the more appropriate. Yeah, no, right. definitely. I, I think actually one thing it's manifesting in, in, in a good side is uh, companies that actually approach underwriters laboratories where we help them with um, actually making a unique uh, differentiator to their product. Uh, so whether it's uh, uh, HP that approached us and where we help them uh, think about recyclability of uh, uh, ocean uh, plastics uh, and how they built that into their products, or um, you know whether it's uh, William Sonoma that have approached us and said, look, we really would like to have um, products that have a uh, indoor air quality that meets our requirement. So we have them UL Green Guard Gold certified uh, of their uh, children's products and furniture that not only helps the consumers, but helps the, uh, the uh, obviously uh, manufacturing plants as well. So you see a lot of great examples with that as well, uh, but we certainly also see the opposite where, um, you know, the small medium enterprises simply don't know yet how to even tackle this. How do we, how do we even get started? And, and one thing is one data point, but actually to see and understand the data and move the needle uh, to see what can I do in order to improve my, my carbon footprint. Uh, I think that's the harder part and definitely something that I would love to see much more partnership around. Yeah, interesting. Uh, maybe I can, Francisca, I can bring you in too to talk about kind of what you're seeing from a forum perspective. I, I personally am curious about how companies think about this problem, whether you need, and, and obviously as Gita said, it depends on whether you're a large organization or you're an SME, but do you have someone who's kind of devoted full-time or half-time to sort of thinking around this problem? Is it just innately part of what you do as, as managing a supply chain or do you sort of carve out some, some, some FTE space within your budget to think about this? How, how do you see sort of, first of all, what, what's, how, what's sort of the forums kind of aggregate view of this and how do you how do you think about carving out time to, to think about this as an individual company? No, absolutely. And I want to, to echo and, and build on what my, my colleague have mentioned before. But you know three three main points that we have observed over the past uh, three uh, let's say 
three to, to four or five months. At the very beginning, it was clear that priority for every company was to protect employees, ensure employee safety, and keep operations and businesses up and running, right? That was the major priority. Everything else was set aside. Now, what is extremely interesting, and that's the second point, is that as the conversation started to shift towards the post-pandemic, the new normal, and the need to reimagine operations, sustainability became and is becoming more and more a driver of resilience. And I think that, Dita, I think you are absolutely right. Uh, you know, there's a big difference on, on, you know, how large corporations can make that a priority or have the luxury to make that a priority. If you are a small and medium-sized enterprise, you are in a different position and may need support. And that's maybe one of the areas in which trans and public-private cooperation is required. But we are seeing more and more, you know, corporations making sustainability become a major pillar of the new resilience and risk management strategy. And I mentioned it before, I think most likely it's because we are all pretty much aware that, that the next crisis is likely going to come from, from climate change. And, and for sure, we, we don't have and we won't have a vaccine for that in the, in the short term. And the third point is that, again, for the very first time, we have observed a significant shift and the sustainability conversation is no longer driven by chief sustainability officers or corporate social responsibility departments, but it's the chief operating and chief supply chain officers that are driving the conversation and the change. Those who, are at the, those who are at the forefront of manufacturing and supply system telling us that technology is ready. Technology is ready. We just need, as Josh mentioned before, we need to rethink the foundations and redesign operations and businesses in a new way that can enable new customer experiences by being more efficient, efficient uh, profitable, productive, and at the same time, delivering value to the environment and society. And we are seeing more and more examples. We are putting actually a, a, a repository of those in which you can see how, how companies are driving this change. And it's for the very first time being driven by those who are at the forefront of, of operations. Maybe just to, to, to wrap up, I think that what we are doing at the forum is trying to bring together all key actors of society to work on three specific pieces and the breakouts we have today will dive deeper into those areas. The first one is on the future of supply chains and where are the key capabilities that governments and businesses need to develop to be more resilient. The second one is looking at how we can leverage new and exciting traceability solutions to enable recycling, reuse and remanufacturing and more circular business models. And the third one, it's all around how we leverage those existing solutions, those solutions that CEOs are saying that are available, how we scale them up, we deploy them to meet the CO2 neutrality targets that companies are setting. And uh, yeah, I think that it's, it's been an exciting journey over the past three months. We want to make sure that this is not just a talk show and that we focus on action. So the idea of the breakouts and the conversation we'll be having is to really inform our projects, actions and impact going forward. Yeah, very interesting. Eric, can I say one thing? Just okay. as I listen, I listened uh, to some of what Francisco said and some of what Gita said, and there's a little bit of a sense that we have to move now because the problem is going to be very soon in the future, right? That the time is short. Maybe this is just because I'm sitting here in California. It's not in the future. It's happening now, like now, right? I, I run a business that has manufacturing facilities in Oregon, right? These facilities were right in the middle of a set of fires, right? Thank God we didn't have anybody who's there who lost a life, but we had people that lost homes. We have workers who can't come to work because of fires. This is not, right? There's a little bit of a sense, and I, I, I have a ton of respect for Francisco. I know, I mean, so this is not about to pick on you, but there's a little bit of a sense that is we thought this was going to be 10 years out and it's actually one year out, and it's not one year out. It's not even tomorrow. It's yesterday, Right, our business, our ability, my ability to hit my 2021 revenue targets, right? The most short term of financial targets. The single biggest risk I face for my 2021 numbers is the ability, because of in part, large part because of climate change, the ability to hit my manufacturing targets. Right? Like this is now. And so there's an urgency. <laughs> 
It's a terrible joke, right? You hear people talk about a burning platform on the West coast of the United States. The flipping platform is literally burning. Yep. No, it, it's a great point, Josh. And I think we, uh, we were prioritizing the discussion of sustainability in shipping and in, in uh, container shipping at a, an event er, that we did earlier this year. And the goal for us was not to look at it as lecturing or, you know, kind of preaching to people, but put it in, putting it into commercial terms. This is no longer an issue that where you're doing something out of goodwill. It's your, you know, a, an industry might not be viable. A company might not be viable in the future. And when you put it in those terms, it, it sort of, you know, sets off a different part of people's brains. And, and there's a, there's an important second order impact that's happening now, which is your workforce might not be viable. Right. Right. So we have people, again, we have people who can't come to work because I, mean, I, I actually don't know the number of people who had to flee their houses. Right. I mean, super stupid thing. Uh, like every organization, you have a comp committee of the board, right. And it reviews compensation policy. It's one of the kinds of things that companies do, our entire comp process, which matters hugely, was delayed because two of the four members had to pack a go bag because of fires. Right. Like this stuff is not this is not the kind of poverty porn you read about and you see and think, oh, that's happening. This is happening right now, right here in ways that absolutely impact actual business operations today. Yeah. Uh can I quickly address, before, we have about three minutes before we're going to break into, uh, break up into those uh, breakout sessions. Can I ask what role sort of regulatory agencies and standard setting agencies play in this whole picture? Uh, I, that's a huge question to answer in three, in three minutes, but are they likely to be a facilitator, a hindrance? depends on what we're talking about. How do, how do we see that sort of playing out? And I'll open this up to whoever wants to jump on it first. Well, I, I may have a point of view on that, being sure. in a uh, business similar, uh, you know, and, and in that for 27 years, uh, and certainly have seen um, technologies of, of all sorts um, having the benefit of having a standard and having some sort of conformity assessment uh, around that, and certainly also, um, knowing that the trust and data, uh, that there is a, a power of an independent third party uh, player in that role as well. But, but it really links around, you know, we need to have data. We need to have knowledge and we need to put that data and knowledge to what is good, bad or ugly, right? So that's why a standard is good, uh, so as to you understand that. And then you need actions. And then there are actions that could be claimed uh, and may not lead to any critical impact, but it's more for, um, well, let's say it investor uh, showcasing, but less impact. So I think, I think definitely uh, third parties and standards and, and thinking around that uh, could have a very interesting role uh, in this space, like, if, like it has had, had for many uh, new technologies and, and new uh, critical points um, uh, that we've had over the last you know, actually 126 years, uh, as long as UL uh, have existed. 